Um, all right, so hi, welcome everyone to Bird Talk and Other story, Stories by Xu Xu, Modern Tales of a Chinese Romantic. My name is Taryn Edwards, and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. For those of you who are unfamiliar with mechanics, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library, the oldest designed to serve the general public in California. We're also a cultural event center and a world renowned chess club that is the oldest in the United States. Uh, right now, still due to the pandemic, uh, most of our activities are virtual, but we are reopening the library and I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It's only $120 a year and with that you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. Our speakers today are Frederick Green and Fia Mehta Shu. Uh, she, uh, Fia is the youngest daughter of Shu Shu and an important, or who was an important Chinese writer and critic who really helped shape the Chinese literary landscape in the mid 20th century. Uh, Fia was born in Taiwan, but grew up mostly in Hong Kong, where her family had taken refuge in 1950 shortly after the founding of the People's Republic of China. Fia attended school in Hong Kong and in France, uh, where she graduated with a teaching diploma. And in 1976, she immigrated to the United States and enjoyed a long career in IT. More recently, she has begun archiving her uh, late father's correspondence, um, which includes hundreds of letters exchanged with uh, notable Chinese intellectuals and other cultural figures. Um, so we're excited to have her on this panel. And Frederick Green, he is an associate professor of Chinese at San Francisco State University. Uh, he has a BA in Chinese studies from Cambridge and a PhD in Chinese literature from Yale University. And he's published widely on the literature and culture of 20th century China. He has long been fascinated with Xu Xu, uh, which culminated in the publication last year of Bird Talk and Other Stories. Um, this is a translation and a study of representative works uh, by Xu Xu, and it was published, by, uh, published locally by Stonebridge Press. Uh, Frederick uh, is originally from Northern Germany, but has reside, resided in San Francisco for some time. Uh, th thank you both for uh, joining us today. And um, what I wanted to tell everyone in the audience is that um, Fred and Fia are going to share their knowledge uh, with us, and we will take questions after the presentation. So go ahead and put those in the chat space and we will try to answer all of them. Um, welcome, Fred. Welcome, Fia. Let me have you turn your cameras on. And um, Fred, do you want to start by introducing us to Shushu the writer and maybe the times that he lived through? Yeah, of course. Well, thank you, Taryn, for this warm welcome. And thank you to the Mechanics Institute for this really wonderful opportunity to talk about Shushu and to introduce the audience to this wonderful writer. So we have a few slides and I will share them with everybody, I hope. Okay, I hope we can see that. All right, Sophia and I want to retrace for you the physical and the literary journey of this fascinating writer through 20th century China. So Xu Xi was really one of the most widely read Chinese authors of the 1930s to 1960s. And he's probably best known for his urban Gothic tales from pre-war Shanghai, his exotic romances, and his quasi-existentialist works from post-war Hong Kong. But uh, let's take a few steps back um, 
whoops, uh, and talk a little bit about his sort of, um, you know, literary career uh, from the beginnings. So he was born in 1908, he died in 1980. And as such, he really lived through some of the big social upheavals that China experienced in the 20th century. And many of his short stories um, are tied up with some of those events in really interesting ways. And in my choice of works in you know, the, the anthology um, that, you know, that came out last year, I try to cover the big historical periods that shaped his life. So the pre-war period in Shanghai, you know, the roaring 30s in Shanghai, the years of war against Japan, the 1940s, his exile in Hong Kong, you know, in the post-war period, the 1950s, and then the economic rebirth of Hong Kong in the 1960s. So Xu Xu is sometimes also referred to as Xu Yu. That was actually the pronunciation of his name that he himself preferred. Um, but because there are alternative readings of the Chinese, the second Chinese character in his name, he is now usually referred to as Xu Xu. In 1927, he enrolled at Peking University to study philosophy and psychology. And he became particularly interested in the work of the French philosopher Henri Bergson, who was very uh, popular in the 1920s globally, and who had a big impact on his work and on the works of many modernist writers. And it's something that I discuss in more detail in the afterword um, um, of, of you know, the translation. I won't be talking much about that today. In 1932, Xu Xu then moves to Shanghai to start his literary career. And Shanghai then was really the publishing hub and the cultural hub of China. And Xu Xu came under the auspices of Lin Yutang, who was the uh, well-known polyglot cosmopolitan writer, also very well known in America. He wrote a lot of uh, works on China in English. Some of you might, might know him. But Lin Yutang wrote, and uh, he, he ran a number of very successful publishing ventures in Shanghai at the time, uh, very cosmopolitan, a lot of them concerned with sort of East-West exchange. And Xu Xu ended up being an editor for a bunch of those journals. One, one of them was called Lun Yu, and there's an image here on the slide um, on the bottom. At the time, uh, Xu Xu himself wrote mostly poetry and essays, but he also started to write fiction. And he embraced a distinctly cosmopolitan liberalism and ex exoticism uh, in his work. Many of his short stories, the early stories took place abroad, but he also really liked to blur the lines between the real and the unreal. That sort of became um, uh, sort of a signature piece of his. Uh, in 1936, Xu Xu leaves for Paris to spend some time abroad. And in 1937, his novella Ghost Love, Gui Lian, that really would make him a literary celebrity in Shanghai was published. And it's a Gothic tale that is set in pre-war Shanghai. Um, and it's also uh, the, the first work in the uh, anthology. And I'm going to read a little passage from that. I'm going to read the opening of the story. So the story opens around 1930 when the first person male narrator meets a mysterious woman at night on Nanjing Road. And here's a postcard of Nanjing Road. Nanjing Road was sort of the Fifth Avenue of Shanghai at the time. And I'm going to stop the sharing here for a moment. What I'm about to relate happened six or seven years ago on a wintry evening around midnight. I was walking out of Shangfen Alley and onto Nanjing Road. The moment I turned the corner, Right there by the tobacco store, I saw a woman entirely dressed in black. There was an incomparable pureness to her beauty and, strange as it might sound, I had the impression that somehow she looked familiar, yet I could not recall then where it was that I had seen her before. Was it because I was drawn to her beauty or because I wanted to figure out where I had seen her before? In any case, I could not help but throw another glance at her. I also no longer remember now whether that tobacco shop handed out matches or had an incense coil for the customers to light their cigarettes. But just as she turned around, she let out a puff of smoke from the cigarette she was smoking, and I got a whiff of its aroma. I'm a bit of an expert when it comes to recognizing the smell of tobacco. Maybe it's a kind of talent. While studying at various universities in Europe, I attended lectures by maybe 20 professors 
and I recognized them all by the tobacco. A hint of the tobacco, even with doors closed, was enough for me to tell who was standing in front of the door or walking past. Thus, the moment I smelled her cigarette, I know she was smoking a pinhead. Pinheads was a, a, a popular British tobacco uh, or cigarette brand that people were smoking in Shanghai at the time. Surely pinheads were a little strong for that lady, and I immediately assumed that she must be a heavy smoker with blackened teeth. What a pity to have such exquisite beauty spoiled by a row of blackened teeth, I thought. I was already on my way again when she suddenly interrupted my thoughts. Human, tell me the direction to Shia Tu Road. I jumped with bewilderment. As she spoke, I was able to see her teeth, or I should say her teeth grabbed my attention. They shone bright white, like a precious sword under the moon. But once she had closed her mouth again, I also noticed a particularly fierce look in her eyes. Her face, which had first had been lit up by the shop's neon lights, was in fact silvery white and drained of all color. Her lips looked especially sallow and bloodless. Had she put on too much powder? Was she recovering from an illness? Still contemplating, I almost asked, why don't you put on some rouge? But it was she who spoke again. Shia to road, I said, Shia to road. It suddenly occurred to me that the reason she looked so pale might be because her clothes were all black. She was wearing a black chipao, black coat, black stockings and black shoes. I also noticed that her clothes seemed much too thin. They were all single layer and the coat did not have a fur lining. Besides, her stockings were made of silk and she was wearing high heels. Could it be that her face was white from cold? I wanted to look at her fingernails, but she was wearing a pair of white gloves on her hands, one of which was holding the cigarette she was smoking. Human, why are you looking at me like that? Her face was solemn, but overwhelmingly beautiful. It now made me think of the face of a silver female bust I had seen in a shop window somewhere along Avenue Joffre in the French concession of Shanghai. So that was why I had thought that I had seen her before. The beauty of her face lay in its harmonious structure that lacked any crudeness. I felt a little comical about my déjà vu experience, but nevertheless put on a serious face and said, even when asking for directions, you should be a little polite. Fine if you don't want to call me sir or master, but how about a simple mister? What's this business calling me human? You're neither a goddess nor the almighty. Actually, I was thinking that her beauty had something rather divine, and so my last sentence had been spoken somewhat inadvertently. I'm not a goddess, she replied. I'm a ghost. Okay, and I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Let me go back to the uh, share mode. Okay, um, so the two start a liaison and the reader then accompanies them on their nightly stroll through Shanghai. And this is really interesting because the geography of Shanghai actually played a really important role in Chinese modernist fiction, similar to the way the geography of Berlin or Tokyo played a role in Japanese or German fiction of the time. And I actually included a map uh, in the book so that readers likewise uh, can follow them on their nightly strolls. So you see, they start here, you know, at that corner where the tobacco store is located, they walk through the international settlement past the race uh, track and they enter the French concession. They walk down Avenue Joffre and then they, they end up in Shia Tu Road. And a lot of the story then, you know, sort of, they, they just walk, they walk a lot through, through um, through Shanghai at night. And while there are references to traditional Chinese ghost stories, the story is really intrinsically modern and a testimony to Shanghai's urban modernity. And it really opens a window onto 1930s Shanghai. The reference to the pinhead tobacco is just one of many. Now, Xu Xu had arrived in Paris in 1936, right? He, he, he went to study abroad, but because of the outbreak of war with Japan, he leaves Paris and returns to Shanghai in 1938. And he remains in Shanghai for the time being, but in 1942, he then leaves for Chongqing, the unoccupied China, where he wrote what is maybe his 
most famous work of fiction, his wartime spy novel, The Rustling Wind, Feng Xiao Xiao, an epic tale of love and espionage in wartime Shanghai. Now, um, the, the rustling wind is way too long to translate, but I actually translated a story, and that's also included in the anthology, that explored a similar theme. And the story is called The Jewish Comet, Yo Tai De Hui Xian. And in The Jewish Comet, a Chinese male narrator travels to Europe aboard an Italian steamer and falls in love with a Jewish secret agent who is fighting fascism in Europe. And the story is really one of the very few works of Chinese fiction that explores the presence of Jews in pre-war and wartime Shanghai. Uh, and that's a really fascinating chapter um, on its own. And I talk a little bit about that in the introduction to the stories in the book. But the story is really driven by the same mix of mystery and exoticism and romance that was typical of Xu Xu's pre-war stories and that had enraged uh, the leftist literary establishment for a long time. So in 1939, the Marxist critic Baren had called Xu Xu's fiction a bomb full of poison, capable of extinguishing the fighting spirit of thousands of revolutionaries. And in 1945, Shi Huai Chi, another Marxist critic, writes especially of Xu Xu's novella Ghost Love, of which I, I gave you the opening, it will invariably cause you to forget the cruel reality of the world cause you to ignore the hideous scars of our nation and lead you to distance yourself from that cruel struggle between old and new that is currently being carried out all around us. Instead, it will invite you to enter an illusionary world. And then he urges his readers to throw Xu Xu's book into the cesspool. And it was really criticism like this that eventually led Xu Xu to leave the newly founded People's Republic of China uh, in 1950, and he went to Hong Kong. Um, and that's also uh, where, <laughs> where fear comes into the picture. So I'll, 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 I'll stop here for now. Those pictures are fantastic. Um, so welcome, Fia. Let's see, you're still muted. OK, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> so. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little more about your father's life uh, sure. after you arrived in Hong Kong? Okay. Um, well, before I get carried away, um, I just want to thank Taryn Edwards, uh, the Mechanics Institute, and the San Francisco Writers Conference for hosting this event. And I also want to thank Professor Frederick Green for the beautiful translation of this anthology of my father's work. And last but not least, a big thank you, Peter Goodman, publisher of Stonebridge Press, for all your effort in producing this beautiful book. Okay, now back to my dad. Um, in 1950, my father left China for Hong Kong, and it was meant to be a temporary stay, um, just to um, uh, stay in Hong Kong for a while to set and, and wait for the situation in China to settle down before going back. But as the Cold War dragged on, a return for China was less likely. So, but during the 50s, he continued to publish many fictions as well as books of essays. And my father met my mom in 1953 in Hong Kong. And my mother's family also just recently went there from mainland China. So the two photos here uh, that I have um, share, to share with everyone, on the left-hand side uh, is a photo given to me by the famous writer Cao Qiren. And um, it's taken in Hong Kong on, on the beach um, before uh, they got married. On the right-hand side, is a wedding picture of my father. They got married in Taiwan in 1954, uh, and I was born the following year. Fred, Frederick, next slide, Fred. <laughs> Thank you. So in 1961, uh, my father was invited to teach Chinese literature at Nanyang University in Singapore. And um, so February that year, uh, my father and I alone went on a ship um, bounded for Singapore. 
And because of visas problems, my mother was not able to join us until late June that year. And um, it was fascinating um, to read the letters my father wrote my mom during those months. And he was recounting all the difficulties he had taking care of me, then only a five-year-old. Um, at that point in time, my father was already 53. So, um, so a little bit background of what's happening in Singapore. You know, Singapore gained governance, uh, self-governance in 1959 after being under control of Britain as a separate crown colony. And in 60, 1963, Singapore became part of the new Federation of Malaysia. Two years later, in 1965, um, it was actually expelled from the Federation and Singapore became an independent country. So we were in Singapore in 61, 62, during this period of political turmoil and when different factions were exerting their influence. And in the university, uh, Nanyang University, it was not exempt from that. So soon after my father arrival, uh, my father's arrival in the university, there was a politically motivated purge of universities, administrators, and professors. And um, a week before the renewal of our visa, which was December that year, my father suddenly received a letter from the immigration um, saying that they're not going to renew our visas. And I remember actually um, very urgently with my mom and my father the day after or um, taking a train to go to Malaysia where we were able to get an extension of the visa for three months. Thank you. Thank you. So this picture was taken in 1963 in March, mid-March, um, two months, uh, two weeks before the expiration of our extension on the ship um, bound, homebound to Hong Kong. And uh, it's, it's my mother in the chi pao, my father in the sunglasses and me, that little girl, and with his students. And the next slide is also, um, was also taken the same day, but I just thought that it's very interesting because you see back then the more mature women still wore chi pao and my father's friend whose wife um, is Malaysian is wearing this beautiful Malaysian outfit and beside the, besides the student, there were um, colleagues and friends of my father seeing us off. And um, after the return of my father in uh, 62 back to Hong Kong, um, he continued writing, uh, published four books of essays, short stories, and novellas. And in 1965, he got a position in India and went to teach um, in the Ar Army Education Corps Training College in Pachmahi, India, which is a very rural uh, place in the middle of India. And um, I included this picture. It's not really my father in that uh, picture, but there's a similar picture of my father with the students, but I, and I couldn't find it. So I figured this picture will show um, everyone the kind of environment it was in. Um, and in the picture is actually my father's friend who was also a professor there. And he was the one who kind of persuaded my father to uh, teach there. And, uh, but that, uh, that, uh, that stay was actually shortened because my father, soon after he arrived, he got very ill. And so he probably stayed for a few months and then headed back to Hong Kong. So, um, the next few slides will be about movies. Um, and many of my father's works were adapted into movies and TV series. And there were um, 15 productions in total. The earliest one was actually um, based on the novel Ghost Love, which um, 
Fred just read earlier. And that movie also appeared under the title Woman in Black, Hei Yi Nu Lang, and it was produced in China in 1941. And the remaining productions are mostly Hong Kong productions. And apart from two TV series that was uh, made in uh, Taiwan and one that was made in um, China, I think in the 90s. Um, this slide showed a picture of me and my father. I was probably 10 or 11 years old. And on the right hand side is a poster for the movie Black uh, Back Door. And this movie is about a childless couple's adoption of a little girl who lives next door. And it was directed by the famous director, Li Hanxiang, who, and this movie eventually won 12 awards um, in a film festival. And um, this movie is of particular interest to me because I actually auditioned for it, uh, for the part of the little girl when I was five years old. And, um, and I was told by my mom that I actually got selected, but on the day when they started shooting, I wasn't available. So I ended up not being in the movie. But now thinking back, I think my mom maybe made up that story to make me feel better. <laughs> so this um, slide actually showed a photo of my father with Li Hanxiang, the man on, uh, on the left-hand side, is di the director of Backdoor and in 1960, the following year in 1961, he also directed a movie, The Pistol, um, by, uh, based on a short story by my father. And um, the lady in Between My Father and Li Hanxiang is the writer um, Sun Baoling, who was a writer, a columnist, and also a socialite in Hong Kong. So on the left-hand side, it was that poster of that movie, The Pistol. The next slide um, is, is, is a photo of the entire cast of another movie, Blind Love, which was made um, earlier in 1956. Uh, my father was, is in the middle of the photograph, um, included in the cast because he actually uh, had a cameo appearance playing himself, the writer in the very beginning of the movie. And these stills um, shows him. And what's really funny about this is that a lot of these movies I nev I've never seen when I was young. And this movie, Blind Love, the first time I saw it was actually in a small movie theater in San Francisco, Chinatown in the late 70s. And one day I just walked past it and then saw this um, poster saying that, oh, a Saturday matinee showing Blind Love. And um, it's um, kind of daunting. You go in the movie theater and it shows up my father, you know, when he was a young man kind of appears across the screen. But um, the, this uh, slide shows, um, uh, it's a movie made in Hong Kong in 1973 based on a very long novel of my father. And again, this movie I never saw until a few days ago when um, Fred um, sent me the link so that I could watch it online. Wow. Um this movie connection is really fantastic. And the, the pictures are just so luscious, um, Fia. But let's go, yeah, it's amazing. Um, let's go back to Fred and talk further about um, Shu Shu's literary works and the stories that you decided to include in the anthology. Um, let's start with Bird Talk since that's the title what can okay. you tell us more about it? Yeah, so Xu Xu, right, as, as we heard now, he arrived in Hong Kong in 1950, and he continued to publish copious amounts of fiction, and he remained very popular with his readers, many of them, of course, were exiles, you know, like himself, and who, who knew him from the pre-war period, and okay, and um, Bird Talk, uh, you know, was, was really 
was, was one of the first works that he published in Hong Kong. It was first serialized in 1950 in a newspaper. And uh, here's uh, an image of the, you know, it was later then brought out as, as, as its own book in 1951. Here's the original cover. And then here's the, the cover um, of the anthology, um, the translation. And, you know, I, I, I think I chose it as the title story because for me, it really epitomizes Xu Xu's literary aesthetics from his Hong Kong period, from his later period, which had somewhat changed from his earlier works. If in his earlier fiction, we see these confident first person narrators looking for romance in Shanghai or in foreign countries and meeting mysterious women, the first person narrator in his Hong Kong works is usually an exile and he's looking for lost happiness, for lost love, a lost home, a time really to which there was no return. The Republican era, so you know the, the period from 1911 to 1949, usually referred to as the Republican period, had ended and the Cold War was a new reality and the world really had changed. And as a result, much of Xu Xu's fiction addresses a sense of nostalgia and homelessness that he shared with so many other exiles in, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, uh, you know, Chinese exiles all over in America and longing for, you know, a world and time that no longer existed. Um, and, and, you know, Bird Talk really sort of plays on that. Um, so, you know, and I, I was going to read a, a little passage from that. Let me unshare. The novella opens when the narrator who is now in Hong Kong, he's sort of stranded in Hong Kong, he receives a copy of the Diamond Sutra, a, a Buddhist sutra in the mail and a letter that informs him of the passing of what we later learn was his fiance. And that triggers a flashback for him that takes him and us, the reader, to his ancestral village in the pre-war Chinese countryside where he, the narrator, who's really from Shanghai, you know, he, he works and lives in Shanghai, he's a writer and journalist, but he's convalescing from an illness in his, staying with his grandmother. And in his ancestral village, he meets this young woman who is slighted by the other villagers because of her unusual behavior. But he soon discovers that he has this very unusual talent. And I'm going to read the passage where he discovers what that talent is all about. So um, I became determined to find out what she was actually up to. And so I rose early one morning, even before the birds had begun to sing. The sky was not yet completely light. And I went into the garden to find a place that was close enough to the fence where she usually stood, yet also hidden by the bamboo thicket. Then I waited for her. It was a hazy morning. The sky was colorless, except for a faint red glow in the east. Soon the birds in the bamboo thicket started to sing. At first there was only one, chirping away in a clear and captivating way and flying from branch to branch. Another one began to sing, as if answering the other. Just then, I heard a response from beyond the fence and I caught sight of the girl wearing a gray dress her hair done up in two braids. A chorus of birds began chirping away from inside the bamboo thicket. The two birds that had sung to each other flew to the fence and began trilling at the girl on the other side. The girl raised her head. Her face was round and her eyes shone brightly. She bore a happy smile. The sounds she was making were beautiful. They neither sounded like the trilling of birds nor did they sound like singing. The girl and the two birds seemed like old acquaintances. The birds flew back and forth between the fence and her shoulder and then landed on the fence and chirped affectionately. By then, the morning haze had already disappeared and the sun shone onto the dewy grass. I was able to see the girl's face clearer now. Her chin was pointed and she had thin lips, a delicate nose and a broad forehead. Her eyes were radiant. What was most astonishing was her skin. It seemed as if it had rarely been exposed to the sun. It was a very light complexion, like porcelain, not at all like that of other country folk. 
Suddenly, a bird flew into the bamboo thicket. Had it noticed me? It called out from inside and then came flying out again. I could see that the girl was looking straight at me now, and I thought it best to come forward and greet her. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. But you probably get a sense that, like in his earlier work, there is a surreal angle, a challenge to realism or what can be scientifically proven. Um, and, you know, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not going to say anything else, but let me tell you that Bird Talk was also Lin Yutang's favorite story by Xu Xu. And it's, it's really beautiful and a little sad, but also hopeful. Um, but yeah, no more spoilers for now. <laughs> You know, I, Fred, I'm really struck by your evocative reading there. I think an audiobook should be in the works. <laughs> you know, I get always emotional when I read these stories. <laughs> no, I want you to I want you to read the whole book to me. <laughs> um, now, I'm curious about the translation process because I know there are some uh, bilingual people, some translators in the audience. Can you tell us more about how you decided which pieces to translate? And I guess what I'm most curious about is um, what you want your non-Chinese speaking reader, people like me, to imagine through these translations. Yeah, you know, as I mentioned, I really wanted to cover Xu Xu's entire literary career from the 1930s through the 1960s. And as a result, the five stories that are included in the anthology are all representative of a creative period in his life. So it starts with ghost love, and that sort of reflects the cosmopolitan flair of pre-war Shanghai. The Jewish comet, the, story, the second story is, is really about the war years uh, and also life in Shanghai in the foreign concession. And then bird talk and the all souls tree is another story, address the theme of nostalgia and loss among exiles in Hong Kong and, and Taiwan during the 1950s. And the last story, called When Ahang Came to Gosing Road, addresses the Hong Kong economic boom of the 1960s. And as a result, you know, the language and the narrative styles that Xu Xu used in these stories also changed from a distinct sort of cosmopolitanism and exoticism early on to a more subdued nostalgia. Um, in his early Hong Kong fiction, and then finally to a much lighter and popular tone uh, that is almost reminiscent, I think, of cinema and, and radio fiction that was very popular in Hong Kong in the 1960s. And as a result, the language throughout the an an anthology also changes and is not uniform. Mm -hmm. um, and also while the stories, you know, they're all very much plot driven and, and quite entertaining, but they also all have a distinct literariness, um, which I really you know, try to capture. Um, I leave it to the audience to judge whether or not I, I was successful at that. Um, you know, as for challenges, sort of translation challenges, there were many. Um, the biggest maybe, you know, Chinese is, is, is really hard. And I'm not really a translator. You know, I, I, I like working with the language. You know, I'm, I'm a literary scholar, so I work with the language all the time. I, I sometimes teach it. But translating literature was a completely new challenge. And this project took me way longer than I thought it, it, it would. And considering how much time I've spent with Xu Xu really since my graduate student days, and then you know, translating them, it's almost embarrassing that I almost that I only managed to translate five of them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, I'm really grateful to Peter Goodman at Stonebridge Press for being so patient. <laughs> You know, after he took on this project, he waited. And then at some point, you know, he gave me a really firm deadline and said, Fred, okay, I need it by this day. And I'm so glad, I'm grateful for both because, you know, without the patience, I <laughs> couldn't have done it. Without the deadline, I'd probably still be editing at this point. Um, so yeah, thank you to, to Peter. And, and I have to echo Fia. Um, Stonebridge Press did a really wonderful job at, um, you know, editing the, you know, the, the cover image and the images throughout, it really became you know, a, a beautiful work of art. 
Uh, and you know, Xu Xu himself was actually very much involved in the making of his books. So he often designed his own book covers and he was very artistic. Um, and you know, I think he would like the product. Again, I'm not talking about my translation, just talking about the physical product. <laughs> I like to think that he, he, he'd approve. Um, but um, so, you know, the process of translating was, was really a wonderful experience. Um, and I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And I feel I really have gotten to know Xu Xu very intimately through this translation work. In addition, you know, I had the very good fortune of meeting Xu Xu's son, Xu Yinqiu in Taiwan, and of course, Fia. Um, and they both, you know, were so wonderful and, and gracious. First of all, you know, allowing me to, to translate the stories but also sharing so many stories and, and mem you know, memories of their father and, and then letters and photos and manuscripts and even an audio recording that all made me feel you know, really close to their father. Um, but I also felt more and more obliged to really try to do justice to these stories in English translation. Um, you know, as for advice for, for aspiring translators, you know, if you, if you wanna do something like this, you have to choose an author you really feel excited about and connected to because you're gonna spend a lot of time in his or her company. And you, I think you really sort of have to try to, uh, you know, imagine, um, you know, what, what the, the author really wanted to do in the way he wanted to, or he or she wanted to connect to the audience. But, you know, if, if, if you take on that challenge, it really is a wonderfully rewarding experience. <laughs> Thank you. I guess the takeaway is, plan for lots of spending lots of time basically <laughs> double triple quadruple the amount of time you think it's going to take <laughs> right <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> thank you um now fia i am really curious to hear as a librarian as a historian myself about your archival project and uh, working with your father's literary legacy. Can you tell us a little more about that and the beautiful bits that you've discovered? Let's see, you're muted. There. Yes, sorry. Um, actually, this, this whole thing came about uh, unexpectedly. Um, in the process of downsizing two years ago, you know, I noticed that I have two trunks which my mom sent on after the death of my father in 1980. And I've been lugging them around for 40 years, never have time to open them. And um, so when I opened them, I was kind of astonished to discover that they were all my father's belongings. There were packages and packages of letters my father saved, some manuscripts, his diaries, you know, um, literary magazines and other stuff, photographs. And so um, I decided to um, kind of tackle the letters first. And this is a very, very um, arduous and effort and it's still ongoing. And uh, at times is, um, I mean, it's always interesting but sometimes it's really exciting. And sometimes reading these letters are just really heart-wrenching. But this whole effort really is a joint cross transcontinental effort with my brother, um, Xu Ying Chu in Taiwan and my sister, um, Qing Yi. Uh, my brother is um, extremely well versed in all of my father's works. And he brings with him this amazing wealth of historical and literary knowledge to help identify the um, originators of all these letters. And, and, um, and when I say these letters, I'm talking about actually a few thousands letters. And my, uh, my sister who remained in China until recently is um, our go-to person whenever we have questions and want information um, of family members and friends who stayed behind in China. So, um, so far we've identified letters from over 
400 friends and contemporaries of my father's. And these are um, friends from all walks of life. And they include um, writers, musicians, artists, politicians, diplomats. Uh, some of them I knew when I was young and uh, others that I had no idea that my father had any connections with. And, uh, and so listen on this slide, you know, I just decided to throw some names and some of you may know immediately um, the writers uh, that he corresponded with, like Ling Yu Tang, Zhou Zhuo Ren, um, a Japanese, famous Japanese writer, Asabuki Tomiko, um, and uh, their painters, their musicians and diplomats, Italian, French. Um, so um, one thing I do want to point out, which probably people may, people may not be aware of, was that my father was actually quite involved in the music community in Hong Kong. Uh, many of his poems were composed, uh, you know, um, uh, songs by noted composers. And I believe that there's also one or two musical productions um, based on his plays. And, you know, when I was young, I remember often going to music recitals and concerts with my father. So on, on this slide, on the right-hand side is part of a letter, um, Zhou Zhuoren, whom some of you will know that is a very famous um, writer, but he's also the brother of Lu Xun. Um, and this is a letter he wrote my father. On the left-hand side is this wonderful picture of my father at the age of two. Um, and uh, and that time, China was still under the Qing dynasty. So the next slide, actually, I decided to include this because um, uh, Sama was particularly interesting to me, and especially the letters, because I am a fan of her work. And I also knew her because of my father. And actually, because of that, I've actually corresponded it corresponded with her a few times uh, in my pitiful uh, Chinese. But more importantly, what these letters show were the exchanges between two writers. And um, in one of the letter, early letter that she wrote my father, she mentioned soon after meeting him, she went and bought the whole collection of my father's works. And what's so um, wonderful to read through some of the letters are throughout all these correspondence um, between her and my father, in, in some of the letters, how she really discussed my father's work in detail. She tells him her, her likes, her dislikes. Um, and so, I just think that it's just um, what an insight into seeing how two artists actually communicate with each other. And while well, working through these letters, not, not only Samuel's letters, but actually all the other letters, uh, not all of them, because I haven't gone through all of them, but uh, one of the most regretful thing for me is that I feel that there's this lack of my father's voice. You know, I see all these letters constantly is from different people. And, um, and the only thing I could do is try to imagine through these letters, what would be my father's responses to them. So I'm hopeful that some of these letters my father wrote um, survive and they're floating out somewhere and someday they will surface. So um, anyway, um, and the earlier slide I mentioned about uh, different kinds of friends. So here I kind of wanted to include some of the photographs or, or images I have. On the right is one of my favorite portraits of my father done by his very close um, artist friend Liu Qiwei. It's a watercolor of my father. And on the left hand side was uh, a photo of my father with Lin Yutang at his 80th birthday. The next photo actually shows my father with um, Dong Haoyun. Um, and Dong Haoyun, let's see, um, Dong Haoyun. Dong Haoyun is uh, the person on the left 
And he was the Chinese shipping magnate who owned the Orient Overseas Line. And he was also the father of Dong Zihua, who was the first executive of the Hong Kong um, self, um, self uh, um, SAR. When um, in with him, my father's in the middle, and with him is Song Xun Lun, who is also a writer and translator. Uh, but uh, during that time, he was also working with Dong, well, Dong Hao Yun. And Dong Hao Yun, he, despite the fact that he was such a successful business um, uh, man, he uh, had a, a deep appreciation of art. And my father and him, and I believe Song Xinlin also, they're actually from the same province. So he always looked out for his artist friends. Um, the next photograph, uh, oh, okay. Oh yes, this photograph actually um, I took in um, probably 78, 79 and a very uh, brief visit uh, that I went home to, to see my parents. And I just decided that, um, that I wanted a picture of my father, uh, what he's like, you know, every day that he's the father that I know sitting next to his desk, you know, uh, reading or writing. And so I took that picture and I'm so glad that I did because every time I see it, it's as if he's just right there. And on the right is uh, a page of his manuscript. The next... So my father actually lived in Hong Kong until his death in 1980. And he traveled extensively to Taiwan, Japan, Europe, and the United States. And I, when I was young, I wasn't even aware of that until I came through this trove of letters he wrote my mother that I realized that he actually traveled so much. And those letters is the result of the fact that they weren't together. And the last 15 years in Hong Kong, my father founded two literary magazines, The Quill, Bi Duan, and Seven Arts, um, Qi Yi, which is the cover that you see here. It's uh, one of the cover of that literary magazines. You know, he continued with his writings and he published 10 books, 10 more books of fiction, essays, and poetry. And um, the last 10 years of his teaching career was as the dean of the liberal arts department and Chinese department at the Hong Kong Baptist College. And aside from his own writing career, father mentored, inspired, and expanded the horizon of many students, writers, and educators. So that's all I have. I'm, I'm also struck by that photo of your father sitting by his desk um, yeah. And then also with your comment about hoping to find letters that he had written in order to rehear his voice. Yeah. Um, thank you for all these personal details. I really appreciate it. Um, so uh, Fred and Fia, I wonder what you think about Xu uh, Xu's reception today, is he still being read in China and Hong Kong? I, uh, Peter Goodman kind of touches on this in his question in the chat space. Um, I don't, you probably haven't had a chance to read that, but I'm gonna read his question directly because it's kind of what I'm thinking as well. Um, so is he, view, is he read today uh, by folks in China and um, people that kind of keep the gates of academia there? That's, that's a really great question. I'll, I'll start and then I'll pass over to Fia because we had actually hoped, we, you know, we talk about this a little bit because <laughs> this, this is really wonderful. You know, um, so by the 1970s, Xu Xu's literary star began to fade somewhat in part because so much of his fiction was grounded in, in mainland China and the Republican period which made it somewhat less accessible for a new generation of readers in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, you know, it was their parents' generation that had this nostalgia. Um, and, you know, in mainland China, his works of course were banned, you know, 1950 to 1980. You couldn't, you couldn't read them unless you had kept some old copies, 
you know, under your floorboard. Um, you know, but that changed in the 1980s during the opening and reform period. And his books really were rediscovered. And after decades of having been closed off to the world, you know, people in China really embraced this cosmopolitanism and exoticism. They loved that. Um, and a lot of his books were, re, you know, reissued um, in the throughout the 1980s and 1990s. Oh, actually, I have an image I want to share um, with you. And then, you know, that culminated in, 2000, in 2008. Uh, that's the image on, on, on the top, um, in the complete works in 16 volumes reissued by Sanlian, you know, very prestigious publisher in Shanghai, to celebrate his centenary, you know, 100th birth of his, uh, his, his birth. Um, now in Taiwan, um, you know, some of his works continuously remained in print. The Rustling Wind, Feng Xiaoxia, that never went out of print. Uh, but, you know, again, he, he wasn't quite as hot anymore, as I would say, post 70s, there was a new generation of, of writers. Um, but likewise, in Taiwan, there is really, a, you know, I think a resurgence in interest and actually a complete set in 34 volumes is currently being, um, you know, uh, edited in, in Taiwan and sort of coming out bit by bit. It's an ongoing project. But what is probably most interesting, I think, is his fate in Hong Kong. So, you know, Again, as there was a younger generation of Hong Kongers, you know, writers and reader, readers and critics, um, they, they felt less and less connected to him, I would say, sort of beginning in the 1970s. And they never really considered him a Hong Kong writer, in part because he never really made Hong Kong the setting of his stories. You know, yes, yeah, sometimes it was the setting, but these people considered themselves as exit, uh, exiled guests in transit. But about a decade ago, that really started to change. Um, and people realized, people in Hong Kong realized that Xu Xu had made Hong Kong his home by choice. You know, he could have gone elsewhere. He could have gone to Taiwan. That's where most of his readers were, but he didn't. It really was a conscious, I think mostly political choice because Hong Kong was the only place in the Chinese speaking world at the time that offered him the freedom to speak out and to pursue his aesthetic vision without having to make any political compromises. And this gesture suddenly began to resonate with people in Hong Kong who about a decade ago saw their own freedoms like slowly disappear. Um, and you know, on, on, the, uh, on the right here, uh, you have uh, uh, selected works of Xu Xu published in 2015 in the Hong Kong Writers Series. So suddenly he is elevated into the ranks of a Hong Kong writer and somebody who is really, I think, admired both for his literary talent, but also for that political vision that, that his aesthetics came to embody. But Fia, I, I know that you, you have some, something to, to say about um, the way music and, and theater yeah. rediscovered. Um, well, in the recent, recent years, some of the more memorable moments for me were hearing about new adaptation of my father's works by a whole new generation of artists. So here I show on the right-hand side is the program of um, the chamber opera adaptation of Ghost Love produced by Repso Arts, which premiered in Hong Kong in 2018. And it's really one of the highlights of these recent year that my husband and Fred, uh, my husband Fred, not this Fred, um, were able to uh, attend the premiere in person in Hong Kong. And on the left uh, was um, a photo that was taken by my nephew when he went to see the adaptation of Ghost Love also that was staged in Shanghai in 2014. And uh, in 2018, um, the, this is a program of the theatrical adaptation of my father's novel, um, The Rustling Wind, by the famous contemporary Shanghai writer Wang Anyi, which was staged in Shanghai in, 18, in 2018. And that's a, actually a snapshot of the play itself. And um, the next thing is that uh, was one day, you know, I just went online and heard this amazing uh, performance um, of, of, uh, of Lu Ren, which is my father's 
poem. And it's composed by this young, talented Hong Kong based composers and uh, composer and choral conductor, Alex Tan, Tang Tian Le. So I say, you know, how wonderful my father's work inspires such amazing creation. And these works, well, in turn, inspired another generation of artists. So, you know, for an artist like my father, what more could one ask for? Absolutely. Uh, it's really rather exciting to see these pieces being um, uh, reimagined um, now. Maybe that means that some of uh, the novels will be translated into English, Fred? Yeah, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Any plans for that? Barbara, uh, no. Not any immediate plans, but you know, I, I do hope I do hope that other people, you know, pick them up and and and, and would, would, would translate them. I mean, there's so much, right? I mean, there's <laughs> 16 volumes at least, and that's fiction, but also poetry and 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 plays. I mean, he really was very prolific. Um, and um, you know, I never get tired <laughs> of reading him. <laughs> Um, but yeah, who knows? You know, once retirement comes along, I'll I'll tackle Feng Xiao Xiao, the rustling wind. <laughs> <laughs> Great, I heard that, Fred. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, there is a involved question by Mark Blum, but before we answer that, I wanted to comment to Renee and to everyone that yes, after the event today after I'm able to process the recording, so maybe Monday or Tuesday, I will send everybody a link to the recording, but also uh, links to the pieces of art that we've discussed, um, where you can buy the book, and other fun facts that we would like to share with you after the event. So look for an email from the Mechanics Institute um, regarding this event. Uh, next week sometime and that will include a link to the video so you can watch it again um, and <laughs> and more details about um, what we've talked about today um, all right now let's see uh, mark blum has a question um, about and i'm going to completely butcher his name lin yu tang right yes um and uh his friendship with your father, Fia, and what similar attitudes that they might have had um, regarding art and entertainment, um, rather than using that literature as a vehicle for propaganda purposes. I hope I got that right, Mark. Yeah. Should, 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 should I yeah, Fred, yeah, you should uh, you should tackle that one. That's you know that's a really really it's a great question. Um, you have to stop me at, at some time, Karen, because I think I can just go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, and this sort of takes us really back to 1930s Shanghai. And, you know, Shanghai in the 1930s was really, I mean, it was really an amazingly interesting city from so many, you know, different, there's so many different angles to that. Um, but it was also a city where in literary and cultural, um, you know, sphere, there were these really hard fought battles um, and, you know, it sort of continued into the 40s and 50s um, when it got really, you know, pretty serious. But really, there was this, you know, you had progressive writers, usually we refer to them as leftist writers, writers who might have supported socialism, communism. And for them, you know, literature had to play a very concrete role. You know, literature was in the service of the renewal of the nation and education uh, and fighting imperialism. So literature was not something necessarily meant to entertain, it was primarily meant to educate. And Fia mentioned, uh, you know, she mentioned in passing Lu Xun, right, that famous Chinese, one of the most famous Chinese writers of the 20th century. He, in a way, is, is the, you know, he embodies that, right, that literature had a purpose, and the purpose was essentially enlightenment. And then there were other people, and Xu Xu and Lin Yutang, were of that camp and they said, you know, of course we are patriots, of course we want the best for China, of course we want, you know, we, we are anti-imperialist, but you know, literature is literature and literature can have a lot of different purposes. And one of the purposes is to entertain. 
And one of the purposes is maybe to take us away from the, the grim reality of, of, of you know, our society for an hour or two and take us to different spheres. Um, so, you know, Lin Yutang was somebody who very much promoted that. Uh, but, you know, Lin Yutang had so many interests uh, and, you know, you know Lin, Lin Yutang, uh, uh, you know, he was not apolitical either, but I think he, he was more of that camp of, of seeing, uh, uh, assigning different roles to literature. And Xu Xu was definitely in that camp and he was in that way very much influenced by Lin Yutang. Something else that Lin Yutang, of course, really embodied was uh, cosmopolitanism. You know, Lin Yutang, he spoke English and French, uh, German, you know, he, he, had ed, he was educated in America and Germany. And this dialogue, this cross-cultural dialogue between China and the West, that was always something that he was very much promoting and very interested in. And again, you know, that did not mean that he was not critical of Western imperialism. He was critical of that as well. But he, you know, he did not necessarily want confrontation. He wanted dialogue cultural dialogue, this idea that we can learn so much from each other. And again, that I think is something that Xu Xu was really interested in. Now, Lin Yutang addressed that often by way of his essays. So he wrote these essays in which he was often, in, you know, very humorously addressing East-West differences, sometimes criticizing the West, sometimes criticizing, criticizing China. Um, and Xu Xu, he also, had, you know, he wrote these kind of essays, but then I think he took up this topic of East-West cultural differences in his fiction, these exotic tales, you know, where you have these Chinese, often these Chinese male narrative narratives, sometimes they're sort of somewhat autobiographical. They, they go to Paris and they experience things there. So he engages in that, that as well. Um, you know, maybe one last thing, um, you know, when Xu Xu was in Hong Kong, you know, the fiction, you know, I read out this passage from Bird Talk, and I think Bird Talk is really, you know, very much representative of his aesthetic vision. But he actually also wrote some works that were somewhat political, in which he sort of tried to comment on the political development, in the developments in mainland China. In, you know, in the 1950s in China, you know, so many of his writer friends were prosecuted, you know, people he had known from the Shanghai period from the 30s from the 40s, I said there was this, this culture war going on. But you know, once 1950s got underway in China and the communists had taken power, um, you know, it was very, very, very easy as an intellectual to get into trouble. And a lot of his friends who might have been left wing, who might have been progressive, who might have supported socialism, but you know, they were still friends, you know, ended up in prison. Some of them committed suicide. So I think he was very much taken by that. He took an intense interest in the de developments in China. Um, and, you know, Lin Yutang likewise, right? Lin Yutang likewise, but of course there was very little they could do, but you know, this friendship they maintained until the very end, you know, they, they as far as I know, and Fia, you probably can say something about that friendship of theirs throughout the fifties and sixties and seventies that continued all along and that mutual yeah. admiration. Yeah, I mean, I don't know more about the intellectual connections um, as much because I was young, but I know the family very well. Um, I mean, I know his daughters, Ding Tai Yi, and uh, um, Ian we've visited. And um, so I just know that in some ways, I think um, he's like a mentor for my father. Well, thank you, um, you both very much. Uh, you, I think you've all given us a lot to think about, <laughs> um, you know, both to learn about uh, Shushu as a writer, as a man, as a father, as a as a, a thought leader. Um, I'm I'm certainly excited to read more, and uh, I look forward to um, reading the book in greater detail because I did glance at it before this event, but. Uh, I really want to hear the audiobook, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> or I should say, Peter, I know you're in the audience. <laughs> um, so thank you both. And um, I look forward to learning more. Well, thank, thank you, Taryn. Thank you, Taryn and, and the Mechanics Institute. And, and thanks to the audience for being here. Yes, we've had a really robust um, conversation. <laughs>
in the chat that it's hard to keep up with at the same time. Um, but uh, yes, I want to share uh, links with everyone in the audience. Let's aim for uh, Monday or Tuesday for that. And everyone who's registered for the event will get this email. So look out for it. And if you don't get it, send me an email. Uh, my email address, I did put in the chat space, but it's tedwards at milibrary.org. Very easy to remember. Or you can just give me a call uh, at the mechanics. Thank you so much. And I hope you all have a great weekend. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>